Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's word. So I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. full trust and my full love and I believe you will bless me more so I can give more in Jesus name Amen Last talk of our series on Genesis today. Talk number nine. Today I want to preach the message, God turns curse into blessing. Today I want to share a bit on my story. When I was a kid growing up, I didn't like to read. Do I have classmates here? I would rather watch of uh, the whole day cartoons than read 10 minutes of a book. That was me. And so all my academic life, I, I just had bad grades even until my college days. I probably had mild dyslexia that was undiagnosed. Because when I would read the words, the, the letters will just invert itself. I, the only thing I remember that when I was a kid, I took up a spelling quiz. And there were 20 words to be spelled. And I was only able to spell two words correctly. It was horrible. 18, I could not spell correctly. I, I could not understand as a kid why receive is spelled with an E-I and a believe that is spelled in an I-E. I mean, who makes these rules, right? So there I was. What made it even worse was, you know, I lost all confidence in school because not only were my grades bad, but I, I share this always that my, I was not good in sports. 
I mean, some of my classmates, they were not good with their grades, but at least they were terrific in sports. I wasn't. You know, and in PE, we were required, required to play basketball. And I did not know how to play. I would remember, I would be dribbling the ball, walking, and then I would trip on the ball. I would fall flat on my face. I would look around me and everybody is laughing, but guess who was laughing the loudest? My PE teacher. So that was my life. To make it worse, I was an incurable introvert. I liked being alone. I didn't like being with a lot of people, which made me a perfect target for bullies. And so when I was growing up, I was bullied. So that later on, as I grew up, I remember watching the movie Spider-Man. And I saw Peter Parker being bullied by his classmates. It was so surreal because, oh my gosh, that's me. That's me. But of course, in the movie, Peter Parker becomes Spider-Man and he beats them up, right? Well, I became a Jesus follower at the age of 12, which gave more reasons for the bullies to bully me. That was my story. So, I, I also shared my story that when I was eight years old, I was molested as a child and that traumatized me. And so you could say that a huge chunk of my childhood was miserable. And there was a part of me that felt that my childhood was cursed. Fast forward, who would have thought that the kid who did not like to read has written 60 plus best selling books. And the logic on hindsight is very simple. I hated complicated books. So I, I wanted to write a book for people like me who did not like to read books. And so my goal was not to impress people with my knowledge, but to pass on a message that will change people's lives. Who would have thought that an incurable introvert would one day lead many organizations and would be a preacher speaking to crowds, somebody who does not like crowds would be in front of crowds almost every day of his life speaking to 20 plus countries. Who would have thought, who would have thought that somebody who did not like basketball today still does not like basketball. Some things don't change, right? Well, at least I bike every day and I believe me at 56, it's the most athletic I've ever felt in my life. But I share you my story to tell you that I thank God that when I look back at my miserable childhood, when I look back at my life and felt it was cursed, I see the presence of God. I see that God was there all along. And do you know what He was doing? Ask me what? He was turning curse into blessing. The reason why this introvert on stage became somebody who reaches out to massive crowds almost every day, the logic in hindsight is clear. I feel people's pain. I feel the brokenness of people because I was broken for many, many years. I know what it feels like to be bullied by life. And so when I speak to people, I tell them, I'm just like you, I know your pain, and I'm telling you God is in your life. He was in my life, He turned curse into blessing, He's going to do the same thing with you. I believe in that. Before I pass on this microphone to our next speaker, I, I need to tell you this story. Crazy story. Woman taking care of her sick husband for three months in the hospital. 
caring, caring, loving her husband who was sick. And then one day, the husband wakes up in the morning, motions his wife to come nearer, sit beside him. And then the husband tells the wife, sweet heart, I realized that all my life, during all my tragedies, you're always there. Always there. I remember when I lost my job and I was retrenched, you were there beside me. The house got burned. Remember that? Remember that? And the wife said, yes, yes. You were there beside me. And remember that time when I got sick three months ago and you, you thought I was gone and I was such a difficult patient, but every day you were there for me. Oh, I, I remember that he went on and on about this and about that and how the wife was there. And then the wife was getting teary-eyed at the beautiful words of her husband. And then the husband said, now I realize in every tragedy you were there, sweetheart, ikaw ang malas ng buhay ko. You are the bad luck of my life. Now, that's a horrible husband, right? The, the analogy is not perfect. But there are times when, when we go through our trials, we blame God. But the reality is that God was there in every single tragedy. And do you know what He was doing? He was turning curse into blessing. Brother Audi Villarasa, give him a big hand. Thank you, Brother Bo. And thank you, Doc Didoy. Can we give a big hand to all our servants here at the feast today for their sacrifices? A special shout out, by the way, to Father Mario Quejadas. Uh, amazing sermon for today. And also special shout out also to Father Bob McConaughey. He's in the house back. Welcome home, Father Bob. I know you can hear us. Father Bob is actually hearing confessions starting now. So let's stay a little uh, composed, so to speak. So everybody say one more time, God turns curses into blessings. I cannot think of a message that is more fitting to end the series, Blessing and Curses, with that message that God turns curses into blessings. And hey, we started the story of Joseph last Sunday, talking about his life, and um, this is part two. The story is so long that we gotta, we gotta divide the stories. And you know, you've learned last Sunday how Joseph was thrown into slavery because his brothers hated him, he was rejected. And then you saw how Joseph was promoted by his master Potiphar. Why? The Bible says that because the Lord was with him. That was our message last Sunday. The Lord is with me. But then soon after, we also see that Joseph is now being thrown back into prison. Why? Because he's accused of rape by the master's wife. So you can see if there's any message that we can extrapolate from this, it's this. That just because the Lord is with you, it doesn't mean that you won't go through problems. A blessed life doesn't mean you've got the absence of problems. A blessed life is the presence of God in the middle of those problems. Can I get an amen? God walks with you in your problems. That's why don't worry. If sometimes, you know, God doesn't remove the mountains in front of you, you want to know why He doesn't do that? It's because He wants to climb it with you. He wants to go through that mountain with you. That's what God does. And so now, Joseph is in prison. And then he meets in prison two of the Pharaoh's servants, the cupbearer and the baker, both of whom have dreams. And then because Joseph is such a master of interpreting dreams. He interprets their dreams and they're wowed by it. And then one of them says, I'm going to tell you to the Pharaoh. But then he forgets. But then two years later, we studied this last week. Two years later, what happens? The Pharaoh has his own dreams. And then he remembers, the cupbearer remembers Joseph in prison. And then the Pharaoh pulls Joseph out of prison. And so the Pharaoh is wowed by the wisdom of this man. You know what he does? It says in verse 41, verse 40, the master, the Pharaoh, says to Joseph, From now on, you will be in charge of my court. 
and all my people will take orders from you, and only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Amazing. From becoming a prisoner, now Joseph is somewhat becoming like a prime minister, having power. That's amazing. That's amazing. But then, you know, the story, it shifts back now. Where? To the family of Joseph. Back to Jacob. And God was speaking something like this to me. Because at the end of our life, you know, wherever you find yourself in this world, however successful you may be, however good you might have been, it always leads back home. Yeah? It always leads back to family. That's why sometimes, you know, when your family is, is messy, there's a problem. So now there's a problem in the family of Jacob. And we're seeing this. We're going to study this. There's a famine in the land. So Jacob's family is also struggling along with everybody else. But hear this out. In, verse 40, in chapter 42, verse 1, it says that when Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why are you standing around looking at one another? I have heard there is grain in Egypt. And then he says, Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we're going to die. You know, sometimes it helps whenever you read the Bible, you put yourself in the storyline so you can imagine yourself being in that picture. I was wondering, this is how I, I, I pictured it. When Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, and I imagine he paused for a moment, and then he says, why are you standing around looking at each other? I just said, there's grain in Egypt. And I thought about that. Why in the world would Jacob say, why are you standing around just looking at each other? There's a solution to our problem. Here's my reflection. The brothers, although it's not implied, the brothers might have remembered that once upon a time, when they heard the word Egypt, they sold their brother into slavery into Egypt. Now what is my point? My point is very simple. Sometimes you try to run away from your sin for so long. You try to... To, to, to cover that sin, sin will catch up with you eventually. You're never too far away from your sin. It's there. One memory, one moment, one reminder, one photo, and there it's back. And sometimes people struggle because, you know, they try to cover up the sin so long, it becomes a part of them. Like they, their, their morality is messed up already. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. How many of you know what I'm talking about? That when sin gets lodged into your life, you know, your morality is just... Can I show you an illustration? Is it okay? In the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to call three volunteers. I'm not going to call it from the crowd, but let, can I call volunteers from our music ministry instead? Let's, let's clap for our music ministry. We got Tin. Everybody say hi, Tin. Say hi, Kayel. And hi, Jed. Parang hindi ka masaya na nandito ka. So I brought something with me here today. How many of you know what this is? It's called Bean Boozled. Raise your hand if you know this. Bean Boozled. Okay, if your parents don't know this, can you please explain to them what this is? This is actually candy. Okay, it's candy. But it's a special kind of je they're jelly beans. But they're special. They're very special. And, and not, they're not the, the special type that you put it in the ground, you know, there's a beanstalk that comes out. No, it, it's special because, listen to this, it comes in very unique flavors. Yes? Some of you know that already. Like, for instance, you get one jelly bean that's color brown. You can either have the flavor cappuccino or it can be liver and onions. Or, here, here's one. If you get the yellow one, you can either get buttered popcorn, ooh, sarap nun, or you can get rotten egg. Here's the one that, that's really nasty and terrible. If you get the green one, it's either juicy pear or booger. And I'm telling you, this jelly beans, it tastes like it. It's... Sorry, ah. Parang gusto niyo na, gusto niyo na umalis dito. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make them taste one, and then you will see their reaction, if it's good or bad. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, I'm sure it's okay. So let, let's, let's give a big hand to Tin. Tin. 
I want you to get one. I want you guys to know that they took their... Tatlo pala yan. Oh, balik mo yung dalawa. I want you to know that they took their antigen tests. Okay? So they're okay. What color is that, team? Green. Green. Okay. So, either that is Juicy Pear or Booger. Everybody count. One, two, three. Kita nyo? So, masarap? Hindi. Hindi. Okay. So, yes. One point. She got the booger. Okay. Let's give a big hand to Kayel. Salamat. <laughs> Kulay green ulit. <laughs> okay. Everybody count one, two, three. He got the color green. Either it's juicy pear or booger. Booger. <laughs> by the way, ha, hindi to planted. So it's it's uh, no, it's it's by chance. Let's give a big hand to Kayel. One more for Jen. One last. Balik mo yung hindi mo gusto, dalawa yan. Unless gusto mo yung dalawa. Okay, what color is that, Jen? Peach. Peach. Peach can either be peach or vomit. So, everybody, count one, two, three. <laughs> so, just by looking at them, you know what they got. Can we clap our hands for them? That's amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's more where that came from, so just approach me after and I'll give it to you. What is the point of that illustration? Tanong nyo ko, ano? Wala. Actually, I just wanted to have fun. But the reason why I share this is that last Tuesday, my son bought this. It's actually brand new because he finished it. And then he bought it in the morning and then the evening. I saw him doing something. He was watching a movie. While watching a movie, he was just eating it. I mean, he was eating it like it was Tic Tac. And I'm like, Ethan, what are you doing? That's not good. Not all of them are good. And he's like, no, Dad, they're yummy. <laughs> and you know, sometimes God will speak to you in moments. And the way it spoke to me was like this, that you know, sometimes when we get exposed to, to, to sin and, and, and we think that you know, it's, 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 it's good and when we try to cover it up and we try to convince ourselves it's good, you can no longer tell the difference between what's good and what's bad. It gets mixed up in your mouth and you're unable to say which is good and what is bad. And so I'm wondering if that's how the brothers felt. And they heard the word Egypt and then it comes flooding back again to them. But okay, let's continue with the story. Now the story goes is that Jacob knew what the solution was. Go to Egypt, buy grain. But then the Bible author says something very specific. It says that in verse 4 of chapter 42, But Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother Benjamin go with them. Why? For fear that some harm might come to him. You remember last Sunday, I said that Joseph was the youngest son of Jacob? That's true. During that time when he wrote it, the author. But now there's another son that comes in the form of another boy by the name of Benjamin. Who is Benjamin? Benjamin is the second son of Rachel. So he is the only full-blooded brother of Joseph. The other brothers, they were 12 in the family, now 13. The other brothers, they were just brothers from another mother because jo Jacob had four wives. Now the favorite wife of Jacob was Rachel. Remember how, how Jacob, uh, rather how, jo how, yeah, Jacob, how he worked for 14 years for Rachel? I mean, how, how crazy must that have been? Some of you can't even stay in a relationship for a year. This guy is working for this woman for 14 years. But let's talk about the elephant in the room first. Yes, Jacob had four wives. Because I don't want some of you thinking here, na, ah, sabi sa Bible, pwede four wives. So it must be okay. Actually, the reason why the author even brings it up is because he wants to talk about the struggles that come with having multiple wives. Husbands, raise your hand. Husbands, husbands. Think about all the lovely challenges that you experience with your wife. Think about it. Are you thinking about it? 
Now multiply that by four. That's how hard it must have been. But why did Jacob not allow Benjamin? Why? Because he was the new favorite. Joseph was gone. Benjamin was the new favorite. So you could see from this point that there's still favoritism. That's what we talked about last Sunday. And so now, they're on their way to the journey towards Egypt. And then it says that in verse 6, since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. And when they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Now let me talk about that for a moment. They bowed down in front of him with their faces to the ground. Remember that 20 years ago, there was a dream of Joseph. And in that dream, he shared to his brothers that he said that one day, all of you will bow down to me. Remember that dream? But you see in this point, the dream was already happening. The intention of the brothers when they started out was not good. They wanted to get rid of Joseph. Why? They were envious, they were jealous, but here's what I believe. It was because they wanted to kill that dream. When they heard that dream, they, they, they plotted against him. But now, you see that this evil intention is actually being used by God to actually fulfill the dream. If there's anything that you need to learn today, it's this. That God can use every wrong thing in your life and then use it for good. God can use it for the greater good. Because He's the God of the turnaround. I don't think you, you, you're celebrating enough. But that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Because I'm going to preach that at the end. So now, we're seeing that this is going to be a chance encounter with Joseph. They bow down. In verse 7, it says, Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. But he pretended. Everybody shout, pretended. He pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? He demanded. From the land of Cana, they replied, we have come to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Once upon a time, Jacob, their dad, was the master of these guys. He pretended to be Esau in front of their dad, Isaac. Remember that? So that what? He could grab the blessing. Now we see that Joseph is doing the same thing. It's a family tradition. Except there's a difference. You want to know what the difference is? Ask me what? The difference is the posture of their heart. The intention. Remember that when Joseph, or rather when Jacob, pretended to be somebody else, it was because he wanted to grab the blessing. But Joseph is a little bit different. When he pretended to be somebody that it's not, it was because he wanted to give a blessing. There's a big difference between grabbing and giving. And I hope that you will understand this today because Joseph continues on with this act of pretending, 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 like I didn't know you, pretending that, you know, I'm the governor. I'm not, he wasn't pretending to be the governor. He was the governor, but he was pretending that he did, did not know the brothers. And so he keeps on this, this act, this drama, until it, it shifts to this weird event where Joseph now accuses his brothers of being spies. He, he's like, you're, you're scouting the land and you're spies. And of course, there's, they're like, no, we're not. But then he continues on and continues on until Joseph comes up with a solution. He says, okay, I'll, I'll believe you that you're sincere if you go back home, go back to your father in Cana, and then I want you to bring your youngest brother with you. And of course they know that's going to be difficult. Of course they know that Jacob, their father, would not allow it, but he still proceeded with it. But then you see the picture changing a little bit. Once upon a time... The authority was with the brothers, right? They had every authority over Joseph. But now you see that it's Joseph who has authority over them. What is happening? Here's a reminder for everybody. Are you, here? Are you listening? Everybody say, I'm listening. Don't ever get too cocky when you're in the top position because you'll never know when it's your turn to be in the bottom. Biluga mundo. Sometimes you're up. Sometimes you're down. You'll never know when God will allow you to experience burnout and downfall. So then don't ever get too proud. What do you do? You humble yourself to know that God is your source. And sometimes, you know, God gives, but sometimes God also takes away. So that's what's happening here. 
The authority is now on Joseph. He is second in command, governor of Egypt. But then Joseph does something. While all of this was happening, Joseph being in charge says to his, to his soldiers, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and fill up the sacks with grains for my brothers to take home, for these people to take home, rather. And then he says, I want you to put back the money that they used to buy the grain. And not only that, I want you to put a little extra more money. In this moment, my friends, we're seeing the very heart of God. That before Joseph could experience the forgiveness, the repentance, the penance of his brothers, I wonder how many of, pe how many of you would do this. He already chose to love them. He already chose to take care of them. Sometimes when we get hurt, you know what we do? We hurt the person who hurt us. But Joseph is not doing that. He is actually giving them more than what we deserve, than what they deserve. Isn't God like that? That God, while you were still a sinner, God loved you? God forgave you? Even before you even deserved it, God gave you Jesus. I mean, how amazing is our God? Can we clip, clap our hands for our God? God blesses you more than what you deserve. Aren't you happy that God does that? He blesses us more than what we deserve. And so Joseph does that. But then this will stir something inside of uh, his brothers. Because that night, it says in verse 42. By the way, you know what? Another reflection there. It wasn't easy for Joseph to do this, by the way. Because he loved his brothers. And though it was not easy for Joseph to see his brothers suffering, he knew it was necessary. And let me just say this. It doesn't make God happy to see you in misery, but God knows it's necessary. It's necessary for your growth. It's necessary for your wisdom. It's necessary for your resilience. It doesn't make God happy, but it's necessary. Yes? So here's what's happening in the evening in verse 27. It says, But when they stopped for the night, and one of them opened his sack to get grain for his donkey, the brother found his money on top of his sack, and then he says, Look! He exclaimed to his brothers, My money has been returned. It's here in my sack. And then their hearts sank. Trembling, they said to each other, What has God done to us? You know, one of the biggest blessings that you can ever have is that you wear your jeans, and then you don't wear it for another week. And then when you wear your jeans again, you put your hand in the pocket, and then there's a hundred peso bill. That's a nice thing, right? Women, wouldn't it be a blessing when you use your handbag and then the second time you use it, you dig around and you look for stuff, you're trying to clean it out and then you see a 500 peso bill? Isn't that exciting, right? But here it's not. They saw extra money, but instead they said, trembling, what has God done to us? What is the author trying to tell us? When you live life with a guilty conscience, you will never be able to appreciate the gifts of God. When you have a guilty conscience in you, a bad heart, no matter how good the blessing is, you'll never be able to use that blessing. Why? Can you imagine thanking the Lord? Lord, thank you for this blessing that I stole. You can't. Because of ble the blessings of God. When you, when you steal it, when you grab it, it will not give you serenity. It will give you anxiety. Instead of being grateful, you become fearful, just like the brothers. That's what's happening here. They're not able to appreciate God's gifts. So reconcile yourself with Jesus. In fact, here's, a, here's an advice. Father Bob is here to hear confession. Confess. Confess your sins. Because until you reveal it to the light, the darkness will always prevail. The darkness will always have power over you. And so, now the image is that they're back in Cana. They're back in Cana, the brothers. And they tell Jacob all about it. And of course, Jacob was not happy. He's like, what are you doing? You're killing me. You already took, they already took Joseph. Now you want to take my son, Benjamin? But of course, you know, Jacob didn't have a choice. In order to live, they got to go back to Egypt. By the way, before J Joseph sent the brothers back, there was one brother that was left behind in prison, Simeon. And he was in prison just to make sure that they come back to Egypt. And so Jacob now, he's struggling. And you see, Jacob was a picture from early on 
somebody who kept on grabbing blessings after blessings after blessings, and you witness that even in his old life, even until such an old age, he's still grabbing blessing after blessing. You know, one thing we need to learn today is we need to learn how to trust God more. We need to really trust, learn how to trust God more because the reason why sometimes we grab the blessing is because we're afraid that God's not going to follow through. God's not going to fulfill the promise that He said. But when you completely trust God, you know that this is going to happen. No matter what happens, this is going to happen because God said it so. How many of you trust God? Can you raise your hand? Amen. When you learn how to trust God, you learn how to surrender. In this moment, Jacob is about to learn for the first time in his life what it means to surrender everything because he allows Benjamin. Even with a heavy heart, he allows Benjamin. But there's a greater purpose why God wants you to let go of that thing. I don't know the kinds of things that you're holding on to right now. You're struggling because you think that there's scarcity. But you will never experience abundance like no other if you don't let go of what's in your hand. Jacob is about to do that now. So the brothers go back to Egypt. I wish I had time to read it to you, but it's such a long, long story. Read the Bible, my friends. Let the Lord speak to you through it. I'm just giving you the summary. Now they're back in Egypt, and then there's, 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 there's this beautiful reunion between Joseph and his brothers for the first time. They found out who the governor was. What a drama. And then they send word home to Jacob. Your son is alive. Come. So Jacob is having a reunion now with his family. What an amazing story, right? You know, we can end the story right now and be blessed. Or we can continue a little more further and you can be changed. Which one do you want? You want to go home and have lunch? No? Okay, can I ask you to stand up instead? I actually wouldn't know what to do if you said, no, I want to go have lunch. <laughs> I want to take this full circle now. Genesis has been such an amazing series, right? It's an amazing book in the Bible, but let me take you home. We started with the message of Genesis where the message was, God made you good, right? That's the first message, right? God made you good. Everybody say, God made you good. Tell your neighbor beside you, God made you good. He did. That's the truth. God made you good. You were created in the image and likeness of God. You are good. The problem is, over time, we're not always good. We forget that we're good. We, 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 we reinvent ourselves. And sometimes we create things that's not even meant for that purpose. Like for instance, let me give you this example. In the 1940s, how many of you are, were born in the 1940s? Anybody here old enough to raise your hand? Strong enough to raise your hand? Walang tulakan. Okay, in the 1940s, there was this student graduate student by the name of Arthur Galston who studied, studied in the University of Illinois and he was trying to look for ways to speed up the growth of uh, soybeans. So he did research, research, research in the study and he found one, one, one chemical. It was called 235 hydro, hydrodobenzoic. I, I hope I'm saying that correct. Triadobenzoic acid. And he discovered that this compound, this, ke this chemical agent, could speed up the growth of plants, of soybeans in particular. But he also noticed that when you put excess amounts, it did not speed up the growth, it sped up the death of the plant. And to him, you know, that's fine, because who in their right mind would, you know, want to kill plants? Wrong. Because in the 1960s, some military researchers got a hold of his research. And you know what they did? they turned it into a weapon. They weaponized it. They were at war with Vietnam during that time. And some of you have visited Vietnam. Vietnam is a beautiful land of a tropical country of fields of green and trees and marine life and animal life. You know what they did? They dropped this chemical agent all over the fields of Vietnam. They called it Agent Orange. And it killed every plant marine and living thing in the area. It got so bad that when Arthur heard about it, he coined the term, he said, that's ecocide. It's like genocide, the killing of mass people, but ecocide is the killing of the ecosystem. God created you to be good, 
but sometimes we distort the purpose by which God created us to begin with. And check this out. In the beginning, we go back to chapter 1. It says that in chapter 1, verse 31, God looked over all He had made and He saw that it was good. Not just good. He said it was very good. Genesis is 50 chapters. 50 chapters. In Genesis chapter 1, God saw that it was good, but then in 49 chapters later, not everything was good. You saw this. There was murder, there was evil, there was famine, there was deception, there was cheating, there was anything. There was good, yes, but not entirely good. So what happened? I hope I can preach this the way I received it. Genesis 1, God saw that it was good. 49 verses later, not everything was good. Would you like to know how Genesis chapter 50 ends? Three people want to know how Genesis chapter 50 ends. Would you like to know how Genesis chapter 50 ends? Okay. It ends in chapter 50, and in verse 20 it says, Joseph is talking to his brothers, and he tells his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Check this out. The start of Genesis is the ending of Genesis. What is Joseph trying to remind us today? Whatever is happening in your life, it's not all good. There's brokenness, there's heartache, there's cancer, there's diabetes, there's divorce, there's abortion, there's corruption. There's evil, there's a lot of things that are going wrong in our life. But the promise of God in the book of Genesis is that no matter what happens, in the end, it will be good. It will be good. In fact, you know, when you go through the next book, book of Exodus, the Israelites enjoyed abundance through the leadership of Joseph. It was amazing. Joseph was an amazing leader. But then they become slaves again in Exodus. And for 430 years, they're slaves until Moses comes. When they were freed by Moses, it was a celebration. After 430 years of bondage. But then what happens? They wander in the desert for 44 years. What am I trying to say to you today? We said this last week, life is not a straight line. There are zigs, there are zags, there are defeats, there are losses, there are gains, there are victories. Life is not a straight line. But here's what I want you to do this week. When something comes against you, a problem, a struggle, a storm, a trial, here's what I want you to do. It's just a simple advice. I want you to start with the end in mind. Start with the end in mind. Let me say that again. Start with the end in mind. If you knew that the end, it will be good, no matter what comes against you, how evil it will be, you know in your heart that God will win. And you will win. Because the ending of it all, even if you go back all the way to the ending, the start of this beautiful book is the end of this beautiful book that God wins. So what do you do? He won it for us all. He won the ultimate good. Where? On that cross. You don't need to do it for yourself anymore. You just have to have life with Jesus, His Son. He is the way, He's the truth, He's the life. Nobody comes to the Lord through Him. So have life with Jesus. It is so beautiful to be in the presence of God. And can we pray right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I want you just to lift up to Him all your needs. Whatever you're going through, He knows what you're going through. He knows where you're coming from. He knows the burdens of your heart. Just, just bring it up to God and say, Lord, 
I surrender everything that all hurt and all pain and all worries and all fear. Lift them all up to you, Lord. I surrender them to you. You are my king and you are the center of my life and I trust you and I know that you are blessing me right now. I receive your love. I receive your joy. I receive your peace. I receive your healing. I receive your provision in Jesus name. Amen and amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Live a fantastic life.